Well, it's a great pleasure to it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone and to uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, it's and uh, especially Michael Spanowski who is giving us this seminar on a day when many people are probably very tired that they uh, were distracted by uh, hijinks as we call them in <laughs> in the U.S. Um, uh, Michael is going to tell us about some novel computational methods. Uh, and uh, he's visiting us from virtually from Durham. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks again for agreeing to give the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it uh, was a long night, I think, for a lot of us, um, <laughs> and no result yet, so uh, there will be a few more to follow. Um, today, I'd like to talk about uh, novel computational methods, um, in brackets, quantum computational methods for quantum field theories. The work, um, most of the work that I'm going to talk about, I have done with Steve Abel and Nicholas Chancellor um, here from Durham. Steve Abel is also in the Institute for Particle Physics Phenomenology, and Nicholas Chancellor is from our quantum computing group uh, here in Durham. However, um, and let me just briefly give here an outlook of uh, the talk. So, okay. Um, so I'll, what I'll briefly do is I'll start with a short prelude, just two observations. Uh, one can, because it's um, <laughs> it's lockdown time this year, right, it's probably a time um, where one can reconsider and uh, go back to basics. And uh, I would just like to share two observations with you in this short prelude. And then I would like to talk about three different steps going from classical over hybrid quantum computing to quantum computing. Uh, to uh, show a few methods that can actually help to um, address problems in particle uh, field theory, in quantum field theory, that could potentially even uh, be applied eventually to particle physics. So let's start with one of these two pre-observations. Uh, um, first of all, um, going really back to basics, one can ask um, what is actually the situation when it comes to calculational methods um, that we are currently using in classical systems. Well, as you know, of course, um, when we, for example, here in a very, very simple example, only want to add six and 10, then we first convert this into a binary system, into binary numbers, and then we have a somewhat elaborate algorithm, uh, which is however well um, 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 encodable in a classical quantum, in a classical computer, which then would add these two binary numbers, get another binary number as a final representation of this procedure, and then we would convert it back into a human, set, let's say human readable form, something that we can better work with, like a 16 for post-processing. So this is not the most efficient way of doing it, obviously, right? Because if you had just a, a line and you had a per, some pearls on, the, on this string, then just flipping six, six times these pearl over and then summing up what you have on the other side would be a much more efficient way of doing it. We are constructing here um, a configuration space that has two to the power of five states. Um, and then we are having to deal with this encoding in different representations and backwards and, um, and decoding from uh, different representations. So overall, it's not the most efficient method, but of course it's something that scales well for more uh, elaborate calculations and it can be encoded very efficiently and processed by a classical computer. This is why we are doing it. Um, the other observation takes us back into the 60s, essentially, back to something that nature actually does, protein folding. So if you elongate proteins, you first have a folded protein, you, you fix the ends, you elongate it, and then you let it snap, essentially. The protein will form, will, will move back into its ground state, will move back into this one uh, folding um, within a very, very short amount of time. And this led to Leventhal's paradox, because if you actually look into the possibilities that full configuration space a uh, protein could take, then some of these proteins would have three to the power of 300 conformations. Now, of course, if the protein had to sequentially test all possible configurations, it would never reach, uh, it would take a very, very long time to actually reach uh, the one configuration that corresponds to the ground state, the, energy, the lowest energy state. And um, therefore, the, of course, the protein doesn't do it. Uh, it will come to the, into the, it will move into the ground state within microseconds. However, even if it was to test all different conformations um, only for a few nanoseconds or nanoseconds, then it would take longer than the lifetime of the universe. And this was identified as Leventhal's paradox. 
the, the thing is, of course, it doesn't test all possible configurations, but it zooms into the ground state rather quickly. Um, and this corresponds very, very closely, uh, something that would could be encoded uh, classically using a steepest gradient descent method, for example. So if we could now encode a mathematical problem into the ground state, and we were able to, mani to manipulate essentially these proteins such that they can encode this mathematical problem, then we could of course use even proteins or therefore any other complex system where we can do this um, to solve a mathematical problem. And this is the underlying observation that one wants to exploit now in everything that I'm going to talk about in all the three different steps, first starting with a classical system, then with a hybrid system, and then with a pure quantum uh, system, where I would like to show that um, a quantum annealer is actually able to process dynamics, quantum dynamics, and therefore serve as a, uh, an honest, a genuine quantum laboratory for um, freely chosen field theories. So, Let's, this, those were the two uh, observations. First of all, we haven't, um, what we are using is not super efficient, obviously, in performing these calculations, but it's suited to the architecture at hand that we can use to actually perform a calculation. And the other thing is sometimes it's better to actually uh, use an optimization method uh, to find a solution to a mathematical problem than trying by hand essentially all different uh, possibilities and sampling blindly through the through parameter space. So let's start with the classical uh, realization of such an idea. And this is what we all know, it's a neural network. Neural networks have been used widely, have been used um, for, for various highly complex tasks, pattern recognition, face recognition, finding correlations, uh, fitting, regression, classification, all kinds of different um, tasks have been performed using a neural network. And the idea is exactly the same as we have seen before. You construct a self-adaptive um, complex system um, and try then to encode the solution to a problem that this system should solve um, in the ground state of a function which we call the loss function eventually. So let's go through this step by step. Um, the neural network is, in, is usually made up of an input layer uh, that corresponds usually to your feature sp space. Then there are hidden in layers in between and there will be an output layer. And in this output layer, you will then have a neural net output and this will be used to um, evaluate this so-called loss function. Now let's have a bit of a closer look what these nodes actually entail. So those are uh, nodes, um, they are also called neurons in this uh, neural network. Um, and they are essentially constructed based on the um, on an example essentially by neurons in our body where you have essentially information transmitted uh, coming from left to right so in this neural network uh, if you just look into this one neuron then it will get inputs from uh, from previous layers and if you have a fully connected network like you see here um, it will get inputs from all previous layers uh, from the all previous all the nodes in the previous layer and then it will wrap around an activation function around it. It will add a bias. As you can see here, the weights that come in are called WI. Then we add a bias to it, plus B, and then we wrap around an activation function that can be smooth, um, doesn't need to be though, um, but in our examples, it will be smooth because we want to actually perform a calculation with it. Um, and then this activation function, uh, uh, after this activation function is wrapped around it, it will pass this, the information on into the next layer. And in this example, this would be the output layer. And in the output layer, you just sum up linearly, essentially, um, the previous uh, nodes. Um, so what you find in your output layer, in this one node in the output layer, is a function of functions, a linear uh, uh, combination of functions of functions. So a highly complicated, fairly complex object um, that can do a lot of things, uh, which I'll, I'll show in a second. But so far, nothing happened, right? On the left-hand side, you have an input. You feed just numerical values from your input into your neural network. It does one forward pass. It will reach your output layer, and nothing has happened. It gives you back a number, essentially, as your neural net output. So now, of course, we will have to tell the neural network what to do with it and perform our optimization. But before we can do that, we have to define a function that has encoded in its ground state, as we have seen before also for the proteins, that um, 
that has in its ground state a solution to a problem. So as you can see here, you can define your loss function, for example, with something like the root mean square error or just uh, some, essentially you can use all kinds of um, um, different loss functions. You construct them yourself, decide for your uh, problem. So if you do regression, usually it's the root mean square error. If you uh, do classification, it's the cross entropy. So there are some standard uh, loss functions that are being used for some of these talks, uh, uh, tasks, but you are free to obviously choose your loss function such that the solution of your problem will be in the ground state of this loss function. And then what you do is you have to modify your self-adaptive network has now to get the information using backpropagation, how to adjust these weights that you have seen before, this W, Bs, and so are adjustable parameters of your network. And it should adjust such that it improves and moves the neural net output into the minimum of the loss function uh, over time by updating the network continuously. Um, this is then done using usually steepest gradient descent or something along these lines just to try to find the global minimum. If you have a convex function, of course you can prove that you find the global minimum for your loss function. Um, how very often your loss function has not a convex form and therefore it might get stuck in a local minimum. This is of course a problem. And I'm gonna talk about how actually quantum computers um, have here potentially an advantage in finding the global minimum. Now, the whole idea here was now to actually perform a calculation with the neural network and not just using it as something that can find correlations. We know that neural networks um, or essentially most of these machine learning techniques are much better than humans to find correlations in high dimensional parameter spaces, right? I mean, if it goes beyond three dimensions, probably already three is a stretch, but seeing correlations uh, in a uh, multi-dimensional parameter space by eye becomes very, very difficult um, if we have a high dimensional parameter space. Whereas for computer programs and neural networks, machine learning techniques, this is done fairly straightforwardly. And of course, they outperform therefore the, uh, the, human, uh, the human mind uh, very, very quickly. However, finding correlations of physics that we already understand and have inputted into a system. So for example, you could imagine to, um, just to use this as a classification tool for events at the LHC. Let's say you produce a signal sample that has some characteristics. You produce a background sample that has other characteristics. And you want to tell a part signal from background. The computer can do this, of course, and can, can do it very efficiently. Now, it would be nice, and I think this is why, for example, machine learning techniques on neural networks have not really made the transition into the theory community uh, to actually generate some new physics, right? If I generate a sample um, for the LHC, I already put in the physics that is known to be the background. I already put in the signal that is known, uh, so the, the physics that is known to be the signal. And then I just try to come up with some way, ways of separating these two hypotheses. What I want to do here is I want to do something new. I want to actually calculate something using the neural network, essentially producing new physics um, by calculating a specific problem in field theory. And there is a nice theorem, the so-called universal approximation theorem, which just says that a feed-forward network with a single hidden layer um, containing a finite number of neurons can approximate any continuous function on, contact, on, on, on compact subsets of Rn. This just means that the neural net output and the activation functions are dense in the space of continuous functions. And therefore, I can approximate arbitrarily well or uh, over time um, these continuous functions. So what you have here is essentially the analytic expression of the neural net output, uh, where G here is the activation function wrapped around the uh, different uh, weights coming from the previous layers and the, uh, and the um, bias B. And in the final layer, all you have is essentially a linear uh, sum of, of all the different uh, nodes that come in uh, and you again weigh them with certain weights in the final layer. Now the point is, this is a highly flexible uh, expression and we hope that the neural net output, which I now call phi in the following functional, can actually solve therefore any 
uh, functional expression, integral differential equation essentially that I can bring into this optimization form. Fm of the domain x, phi m of x, grad phi m of, a, of x, and so on with multiple derivatives um, equals to zero. This by itself, as you can see, is an optimization problem because I try to find phi such that the whole functional um, equals zero. Uh, and to do this, all I have to do is to construct my loss function, this potential shaped object, such that I get phi back from the network and phi can be multidimensional and it can be a multidimensional domain as well uh, over which I try to find the solution. So the loss function could, for example, look like this. We have um, the uh, root, so we have essentially the root mean square error of the functional we had before, plus boundary conditions in case we are looking in solving a differential equation. Altogether, in the sum, uh, gives then the loss function, and we are trying to minimize the loss function. And the closer we get to zero for the loss function, the better we will have um, satisfied the numerical equation and the closer our uh, neural net output will match the solution for the functional and the boundary conditions in terms of the symbol phi. Now, this sounds a little bit abstract. Let's have a look. Let's have just a quick look into um, an example. So a very simple differential equation, which we could actually solve uh, in our head um, would be the one you see here on top. This is just um, a normal ordinary differential equation and the neural network quickly runs here using this loss function and converges into the correct solution, numerical solution for this differential equation, right? You can now continuously improve it, but it freezes out fairly quickly after a few steps. Uh, the network is in, uh, updated, all the weights are updated after each of these steps. And this, of course, is not a very impressive um, um, result because this is a very simple differential equation. But um, the next one would be, for example, a coupled uh, um, partial differential equation. Uh, and also here, you find very, very good results, um, even with one layer. Now, what you see here on the right-hand side is how much the uh, neuron, uh, the lower part that looks like the union jack, uh, it's actually the standard default MATLAB color scheme. So it's not because I'm from the UK choosing this color scheme. Um, this is an error of 10 to the minus three across the plane uh, here. But if you, for example, added a second layer to the neural network, a second hidden layer to it, then you would improve this uh, error by a large margin because additional layers means that you can map out much larger nonlinearities. So um, nonlinear behavior um, that is strongly nonlinear uh, requires more nodes, requires more weights to adjust, and um, you can improve your result continuously. The nice part here is you get a feedback, right? I can now look into the whole domain and evaluate for each point how close my numerical solution I get from the neural network uh, comes to the actual solution, to actually satisfying the functional equation, the optimizing of the, of the, the functional equation f hat S equals to zero. Sorry to inter interrupt you, Michael. Yeah. Can you, I, I'm not quite sure how to read your, uh, your graph. Yeah. The wh where is the exact solution and or versus the uh, exactly the approximation? So, I, yeah. I didn't. So this is um, this is the the exact solution is not written here. Um, I only have written the differential equation, then the boundary conditions, and the domain is zero as uh, x and y axis. As you can see here, this is just the full domain, and then uh, the the color scheme as you see here. Um, written along the y-axis essentially, but on the other side of the y-axis, you see phi hat minus phi times 10 to the minus three. So this just indicates the neural net output phi, so the difference between the true, the actual solution, and the neural net output um, multiplied by 10 to the minus three. So the errors are fairly small. Um, Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't, unfortunately I can't read the, uh, yeah, I'm missing my large screen. It's too small. The right is too small for me. So, with, with this plus three, if you want to have uh, differences of the order of 10 to the minus three. Yes. 
So the, the errors are per mill level at this point, but okay. it's completely unoptimized um, in the sense that I, I, I wanted to use exactly the same network as in the previous example, which is a very shallow, small network. I think 10 nodes, one layer was early enough to get a per mill error for this differential equation. I also add a different uh, multitude of layers and you get dodge 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six across the whole board. So you wipe out essentially this um, union check colored um, uh, map um, and you, you make it completely white if you kept the relative error on the y-axis. So um, this just tells you that the deeper you make your network, the more nonlinearities you can map out uh, extreme very well. But this was also not really a physics example. I just wanted to show uh, here, I, I, I'll increase a little bit the complexity and the relevance for physics here for going from step to step. The first example was very, was trivial. The second one would not be easy to solve uh, in, uh, by, by hand very quickly, but of course it's also doable using Mathematica or uh, some other way. Um, now the next thing would be, for example, to look into a semi-classical calculation, performing actually a non-perturbative calculation. And in recent days, and I've also seen you had recently um, a talk for on gravitational wave uh, spectra. Um, of course, this became um, a very popular topic because um, first order phase transitions in the early universe could give rise to stochastic gravitational wave spectra, which could potentially be observed at future gravitational wave experiments. And um, therefore, a lot of effort is currently being dedicated to calculating such uh, transitions in the early universe. And this would just be one example. So you would want to see whether, of course, in the standard model, it's not realized as a first order phase transition. So you would have to increase your particle content um, at the electroweak scale if you are looking into an electroweak phase transition. And then, however, uh, a second minimum could uh, arise. And you could potentially have a transition of, we could live in a, we could have been in a false vacuum and then a deeper vacuum I could have arisen around the right weak scale. And uh, such a transition could then form a strong first order phase transition, which with the formation of bubbles in the early, early universe. So the way you usually do the calculation is you actually solve the bubble equation of motion, which you see here. Um, and this is just a differential equation. Um, now, depending on your potential and what your field content is, this can be more or less complicated. And usual methods are, for example, if you can solve it analytically and you have a specific situation, then you could potentially use a thin wall approximation. There are polygon approximations over an undershoot method, which you can use in one dimension rather efficiently. But as soon as you go into more dimensions, it's, it's going to be a mess. And of course, there could be this neural net approach that I just showed, which I worked on with my uh, PhD students. And it turns out that this neural net approach I just showed before is extremely uh, reliable um, and much more reliable actually, actually as existing um, dedicated solvers for these bubble equations. So what people are using uh, when they are trying to calculate the stochastic gravitational wave spectrum um, and they want to calculate the bounds and the path underneath the barrier, um, they would usually resort to something like Cosmo transitions or bubble profiler. And um, the upper left part, uh, the upper left plot shows just that the neural net path for this example and the bubble profiler path are correct, but Cosmo transitions, which is the much more uh, famous and prominent uh, tool that's being used widely, uh, doesn't get the path right, for example. It's not a trivial thing to do. And I've seen uh, other cases where bubble profiler fails off over completely, but the neural net approach is very reliable and gives you the, the right answer. And just recently, uh, a few weeks ago, we looked into the expansion speed of uh, bubbles in the early universe. And you can also calculate here um, reliably um, things uh, that you can solve essentially the expansion of bubbles reliably and fairly quickly using neural networks. Um, and we were not able to solve these equations, for example, in an, a different way, like using Mathematica or so. I'm sure there are dedicated ways of investing a lot of time of solving part partial differential equations that go beyond what Mathematica can, can do and could certainly rival to some degree these neural net uh, approaches. But I think it is already quite interesting to see that you have here a very uh, usable tool that can outperform other calculations that you can, for example, that you try to do with Mathematica, but fail to do so. 
Now, this was the classical part. What I this kind of, uh, concludes. Could I that, interrupt for just uh, just a moment? Uh, uh, you know, in machine learning, there's always this issue of, of overfitting, uh, and this is not something that you're concerned about here. No, because overfitting cannot occur here. Um, yeah, yeah, because okay. you're trying. Yeah, you're trying Thank to you. find the solution in every point of the domain. So yeah. Um, exactly. So this was the classical part. Now maybe let's move on to quantum computing and do an intermediate step first um, with hybrid quantum computing before moving on to complete quantum, uh, yeah, a qu complete quantum system and looking into dynamics of a quantum system. Now, if you talk about quantum computing, you always have to show. You probably contractually obliged to show this this plot where uh, uh, Sorry, just before you go on to that has this been you this uh, system been used for things like the navi stokes equation ah Jeff? perfect that's a very nice that's a very good question finally then yeah so there was actually a huge halabaloo uh, on the internet just a few weeks back where a team used exactly this approach on the Navier-Stokes equation, however, performing the, the, the learning or the fitting in Fourier space. And they were speeding up previous um, approaches and dedicated Navier-Stokes uh, uh, Stokes equation solvers by orders uh, of magnitude in speed. And this was uh, highly featured across um, all kinds of social media outlets even, um, where celebrities commented on this. <laughs> Uh, Hammer, MC Hammer is uh, as a musician. He even apparently is interested in this kind of stuff, and he uh, commented already on Twitter. And uh, apparently, um, this was uh, extremely strongly featured um, widely uh, that you can actually uh, take this approach, um, solve the Navier-Stokes equation with it faster than previously known solvers. However, they also uh, were very clever uh, because they were going into Fourier space. So if you then expand your solution in Fourier space and you learn essentially the Fourier coefficients directly, then it converges extremely quickly and you get uh, the very precise solution for the Navier-Stokes equation uh, rather yeah, yeah, amazingly fast. Um, so the next thing would then be talking about quantum computing. And usually um, complexity of computation is uh, classified in uh, different um, categories. So P would be uh, deterministically solvable in polynomial time. NP would be deterministically uh, solvable. Um, so non-deterministically po polynomial, which means that if, it, that if you had a solution, um, you can uh, evaluate the solution in polynomial time but it doesn't mean necessarily that you can perform the calculation in polynomial time. So if it's NP complete, then uh, a non-deterministic Turing machine uh, can perform this calculation in polynomial time and NP hard is even more complicated uh, to perform. For us, this is not necessarily very important, but um, the thing is that we actually eventually want to look into icing models. And as you can see here, Solving icing models actually is NP is an NP hard problem, and uh, so we will have to look into approaches to handle extremely complex configuration spaces to actually apply them to field theory eventually successfully. Now there are two major approaches these days. There are more, but um, I'll comment on the two main approaches uh, for quantum computing. One is discrete gate quantum computing, and the other one is quantum annealing. Um, they have different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage of a discrete gate quantum computer is that it's universal, so it can perform any computational task um, with the right algorithm. Uh, whereas a quantum annealer is not, it is only able to do a specific set of tasks. However, um, there is a huge advantage these days on the um, technical side for quantum annealers because it allows you to access here in the cloud up to 5,000 qubits using D-Wave. Whereas IBM Keyskit um, or IBM computers are, and also all the other um, discrete gate computers are limited to something like 50 qubits. And to simulate a field theory on such devices, um, you want to have more qubits, as many qubits as possible. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, obviously, there's a lot of expertise uh, at Diaz. Um, um, I've just seen on the web page that uh, Luke and Ian, I think, won this um, hackathon challenge uh, of IBM. So apparently, um, you are very familiar, obviously, with the discrete gate uh, quantum computing approach. However, I want to, um, the advantage of a quantum annealer is that it has, allows you to uh, describe dynamics in continuous time. Right, a, a gate quantum computer would operate, so you can essentially expand your Hamiltonian and um, in this uh, Trotter Suzuki formalism, um, and you can essentially evolve your states in discrete time steps by applying gates. How these um, states evolve. However, on a quantum annealer, you have a continuous time because the dynamics is actually provided by the quantum annealer itself. And this is, of course, a more natural environment for a field theory, uh, which would uh, evolve in time uh, continuously. So, but we would still have to introduce something like um, uh, qubits. So we. Uh, but but it, isn't the difficulty there that you uh, that you uh, have difficulty finding the annealer appropriate to your problem? That absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure there are any really that are useful for a lattice gauge theory. No, that's uh, very good. So we will, we will go through the whole thing uh, in a second, but you're absolutely right. So the annealer is suited, and I would say ideally suited for the problem I'm going to discuss, uh, namely tunneling. So you will, you will see that we will be able to encode an, uh, a field theory on an annealer, and you will see, and I'll do this uh, in real time in a second, you will see a state tunnel from one place to another. And then I would argue that this is actually what a quantum laboratory should do. Um, for if, if you, for example, wanted to do something like a scattering of um, incoming particles, you would have to prepare the initial state accordingly. And this would be very, very difficult to do for, for an annealer. Um, so I'll, I'll come to this in a, in a second. Um, so now the next thing is um, the qubits. Um, so as you see here, the qubits um, could be represented by a vector on the block sphere, and then the poly matrices would allow to rotate it uh, around uh, this uh, about this block sphere. Um, now they have been used in all kinds of different frameworks for discrete quantum computing, and of course there are um, quantum advantages have been shown for entanglement, uh, cryptography, Schwarz and Grover's algorithm, and so on. But um, for the annealer, what you are working with is a certain structure of your Hamiltonian, namely given here as on the bottom of the slide uh, in terms of this sigma i, sigma j, which applied to uh, a zero and a one state give you just the, eigen, the, eigen, uh, the eigenvalues back plus minus one. And then on the right hand side you have of this equation, you have also the sigma i x, which flips essentially states in your um, in your state vector. So you see this here on the right hand side with the cube. Um, sigma i x um, makes your states hop in uh, this humming space or in the Hilbert space you apply your Hamiltonian to. Um, the task will now be obviously to actually encode your problem in terms of these matrices uh, j i j or h i the magnetization. Um, this is the part where you have to encode your quantum field theory, and then there's a time-dependent component, this delta t times sigma i x, which uh, performs the quantum um, resampling. And as you can see here on the bottom, this is how you can adjust your delta t. You can lower it, you can increase it, and therefore you can increase the quantumness of your system, and you can reduce the quantumness of your system. So the quantumness of your system is a free parameter that you can crank up or reduce. And this, of course, will then change your dynamics in your quantum system significantly. Now the question is, there are different ways of annealing. We don't need to do actually quantum annealing. We can do this hybrid approach um, in some sense, um, where, we, um, also, where we either perform quantum annealing or we perform thermal uh, annealing. And there are two different advantages depending on your loss function or depending on your energy landscape. So if you're, for example, in this state on the left-hand side, and you have an extremely wide uh, barrier in between, between the global uh, minimum and your local minimum where you are uh, at the moment, 
then it's probably um, more efficient to go over the barrier. If it's wide and shallow, uh, then you probably go um, wide and not very high. You probably want to go over the barrier. Tunneling would be very costly and would take a long amount of time to actually do. Um, and thermal annealing might then be the choice um, for you to actually sample the system. Um, however, on the other hand, if it's a very narrow, uh, so for example, if you then in the second step, in the lower part, this elongated red, uh, uh, pick, this elongated red ellipse, then you essentially want to use tunneling because um, it, um, it would essentially sample these uh, separated, maybe through a high potential um, different minima, and you could tunnel underneath the, the barrier essentially to find the global minimum. And thermal annealing is then implemented using this metropolis algorithm. The metropolis algorithm essentially uh, looks into your configuration space. It touches upon spins. It looks at your spins and performs, tries to perform a flip. If this flip is energetically beneficial, it will just be accepted and you perform this flip. If it's not energetically um, beneficial, then you uh, might still accept it, but exponentially suppressed by the temperature. So you would then calculate delta H, which would be positive in this case, and then you would, if, uh, you would randomly select it based on e to the minus delta H divided by KT. Um, and of course, as you can see, if you look into the WKB approximation, the probability actually to tunnel looks very different. So it really depends on the width of your, of your wave function to be able to tunnel. So there are two very, very different sampling methods that can, however, depending on your uh, energy landscape, be beneficial or less beneficial. <clears throat> now let's have a look into an example. Again, starting rather, uh, yeah, let's say slowly, here with an uh, example of an icing model. So these color graph um, exercises are um, very common in quantum computing um, because it's, it's, it's known to be an NP problem. And the task is to uh, color these graphs, but um, such that as few uh, dots as possible are connected with the same color. So for example, um, you, you see this, it will, not be, it will not be possible to have everywhere um, um, different colored objects next to one. So the black one will have to have uh, a, a black and a white one somewhere else. But um, the, the task is for the overall object to have as few um, with the same color adjacent to each other. So as you see, this can be encoded here below in this Hamiltonian. You first of all uh, take a preference, so minus lambda sigma iz means you have the smallest h if all of them are actually plus one, so if all of them are colored. But then, of course, you would just color everything black and this is not what you want. So you will have to have a frustration here, and this is the second term in these linked pairs. So you have sigma iz plus sigma jz, and then you have some contribution sigma iz, sigma jz multiplied with each other. So this contribution is positive if sigma i and sigma j are both minus one or both plus one. So if they have the same color, it increases the overall energy of your system. If they have different colors, it lowers the overall energy of your system. So it's beneficial. And this is essentially telling you that it tries, while, while optimizing this configuration by coloring in and not coloring in, uh, different uh, of these nodes, uh, it will always try to reduce the number of similarly colored objects next to each other. Now, this is a very simple example. We can have maybe an example that is more uh, suited for our days. So here, being here at the university, we might have, <laughs> hopefully not, but one might have uh, the task that there could be n square students to sit an exam in a square room with n times n desks, uh, which are 1.5 meters apart. Half of the students could have a virus, while half of them do not. So how can they be arranged to minimize the number of infections due to uh, less than two meters social distancing? And it's exactly the same problem we just seen, but we will do this now in an n times n uh, uh, lattice space. And you see here exactly the same thing. This Hamiltonian um, 
TFSU um, essentially um, one minus the frustration, uh, so sigma L n plus one and sigma m n plus j. So again, if they um, are different, then um, you get zero. Uh, so th then you get a, a so if they are different, then you get minus contribution, which is then plus, and you increase it. And if they are the same, you reduce it because then one minus uh, one would be zero and one uh, yeah, yeah, in both cases would be zero. And what you also need to do is you need to add boundary conditions. As you can see here on the lower part of, the, of this slide, um, the number of students that have or don't have a virus should not change over the course of this, um, of this test. And therefore you have to add boundary conditions to uh, retain the same number of them. And what you then can do is you can put this into your uh, thermal annealing algorithm and try to find the ideal solution to arrange um, these students accordingly in this n times n room. Now, I mean, every, everybody, a human mind would probably know what the right final solution is, right? Um, you want to have as few people adjacent to each other um, which have and do not or do not have a virus. So obviously the line, one line across the room would probably be the, be the ideal solution. It takes a while for the algorithm to find, but it optimizes correctly into this solution. Now, once more, not a particularly um, exciting example because we could of course easily find such a solution, um, but these things can be actually used directly um, for uh, spin lattice systems, which I'm working on with one of the postdocs here in Durham. So you can actually have here a, a field theory with a jolashinsky morea term, and you can just lattice it and, and put this onto a thermal annealer, and you can then calculate domain walls, instantons, and merons, and so on, and this uh, in one plus one, two plus one, and so on dimensions. This works according in exactly the same way as I've just shown just a little bit uh, more complex. Um, and you can do this for different spin systems. This can be, for example, directly relevant for even industry applications. We are working together here with the Skirmian group um, in, uh, in, the, in, in Durham. So there is a large grant and we are trying to simulate Skirmians, for example, in different uh, materials. Now, I don't want to talk about, uh, we could apply this obviously to such an example, but a more basic example, which we then will be able to port actually onto a true quantum computer would be tunneling for a scalar field theory. So once again, let's go back uh, from the previous example and the, uh, in the classical situation where we discussed already tunneling. Um, we are now doing this here for uh, this hybrid and quantum uh, computing approach as well. We take here a specific example, namely, for example, this thin wall uh, realization here at the bottom of the slide. And what one has to calculate is the <clears throat> O4 action. Um, and or, yeah, we can essentially calculate this for uh, the action would be given here in the C plus one uh, dimensional case. Um, and as I said before, what you usually do is you use, you calculate the Euler Lagrange equation, um, the, equation of motion for the bubble. Um, but this is not what we want to do here. We actually want to optimize uh, our system such that we can directly calculate the action S1 here on the lower right part. So we assume here C to be uh, zero just for simplicity. Uh, and we try to um, calculate directly S1 um, and optimize the integrand of the action directly, not using the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now to do this, we would have to um, encode now this field onto um, a quantum annealer, onto an annealer. Um, and to do that, we have to first discretize the field. Um, so you, you essentially start by phi of rho L and you just discretize the field. And the field value is given by the frustration term in the domain wall approach. So we are using here this domain wall encoding and the field value phi of rho is given by the point in the chain where for the first time you swap from minus one to plus one. So if you have larger field values, then you would be further to the right. If you have smaller field values, you would be further to the left. And <clears throat> this works exactly the same way as before with this one frustration term I have showed with the, um, for, for coloring in these graphs. 
if you have this sigma um, i times sigma j, um, then for adjacent uh, qubits, then it will give you zero contribution unless you have a frustration and you look into an, a, a, a pair of qubits where the left one, for example, has minus one and the right one has plus one. For all the others, it will give zero contribution. Now, what you also want to avoid is that you have multiple frustrations along this domain wall encoding. Uh, and so you have to pay, you have to encode here this uh, Hamiltonian contribution H Jane, which where lambda has to have a very large value because you want to discourage uh, the system to go into a situation where you have multiple frustrations along one domain wall. And this you can do again by just adding up multiple contributions of multiple frustrations to the overall energy budget, um, yeah, which is done by this H chain contribution. And now that we have discretized it, now that we have written down the Hamiltonian that can give you the field value and, the and it forces you to have only one frustration along these domain chains, now you have to ask yourself, okay, you also have to encode it obviously into, uh, into um, an icing model in terms of the matrix J and the matrix H, where H is the magnetization and J is the usual sigma I, sigma J pre-coefficient. Um, and if you do this, you can also encode a potential as a whole because the potential is just um, the, uh, evaluating the field um, or evaluating uh, is being evaluated at the field value itself. So it's just it's fairly simple just to add any kind of um, analytic potential uh, onto the spin chain. Now it's easier to visualize it actually what what we what we have done uh, rather than talking about it. So we have now a domain row over which a field is defined and the field value is given by the point in the domain chain where you have the first frustration. Um, this is, and this comes back to what I said in the first observation, it's not efficient, right? I mean, to encode here one field value, we are using say 50 qubits. It's, it looks very inefficient obviously to do that. But this is um, not so different from what we are doing uh, on a classical device as well at the moment. It's also highly inefficient to go into a binary system and then applying a fairly elaborate algorithm on this binary system. So this is uh, what we do here and um, I'll show that it works out. Now the only thing that is missing for to actually uh, solve the action and optimize the action uh, in our uh, integral is we have to encode the kinetic term as well. So this is the first term where actually adjacent uh, domain points would talk to each other, but you can do this also uh, in a very similar fashion using a discretized system um, and encoding this then into the J's uh, because you need now two sigmas, um, encoding this now into the J matrix of your icing model. And eventually you sum everything up. You have H chain, H QFT, H boundary condition. And this is your whole system. And then you uh, for, perform, for example, some term, thermal annealing. Now the, the problem is of course, this annealing process can be fast or can be slow. You can do it the right way or the wrong way to actually zoom into the ground state of your uh, energy profile. So if it's too hot and you didn't cool down much, it will go in, potentially into the ground state, but it might jump out. So it will accept a lot of flips uh, and it, it oscillates uh, and it will not settle down. So this would be um, finite temperature uh, field theory essentially, where you don't uh, rest into the ground in the ground state of your system, but you might jump out and you might go in and out of a local minima. Now you can do the same thing for the too cold situation and you just shock freeze and you end up in a local minimum and you just get stuck in a local minimum and you will never be able to leave it. Now, of course, you can do it properly as well, and then you would find the ground state of this uh, solution, uh, of this system, and you would find the correct solution for your field theory, um, and you would find the bubble, the, uh, the tunnel part, the bound solution essentially for your tunnel process. This whole thing was now done uh, on a classical computer using thermal annealing, but D-Wave offers you to access their systems, and you can actually submit to a hybrid quantum computer. And we did this and submitted our icing model to the D-Wave quantum computer and it came out uh, perfectly, essentially. There was no tuning or anything, you just submit it there. What they are doing is they're running it um, 
on, on uh, partly on a neural network, but in parts also sub supported by a, a, a quantum annealer. And these uh, results you get extremely quickly. So this kind of worked out. And this is the, the part where um, we looked into a hybrid approach. Now, before moving on to an entirely quantum approach. The issue is, of course, why wouldn't we uh, do it um, directly on a quantum computer? Why going through a quantum annealer? Well, if you really want, what we do here is we solve the differential, um, so the Euler-Lagrange equation. We are solving actually a differential equation. And this doesn't work well if you have um, a large domain and you need connectivity between the different uh, um, domain chains um, because you want to calculate the derivative. These chimera structures on the D-wave quantum annealers allow you only to we have only full connectivity between seven other uh, qubits. Um, and therefore, you don't have the ability to essentially, for each slice of your domain, um, to evaluate the, the differential for the adjacent uh, field value. And therefore, the connectivity is just not there yet to actually submit the calculation of a differential equation directly to the uh, quantum computer of the quantum annealer of D-Wave. However, yeah. sorry, what is, what is it? What is the chimera? Yeah, this is the seven um, qubit structure you see here. So what you see here is that if you look into the upper left part of this uh, image, A and A, so there's Q1, and you see that the left Q1 talks to all the other Q1s uh, in this block. There's a direct, it's connected to all the lines, right? Oh, yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, but it's not true, for example, for um, other um, nodes in this whole setup. Um, and therefore, if you want, you, you would need to find an embedding of your icing model such that you can actually calculate the derivative for each point on your domain. And this is unfortunately not possible uh, with this uh, current Chimera structure, with, which, which has these full connectivities in these individual blocks, but not across different blocks. But oh, I see. I see. This is a, it's a particular structure of D-wave. Yes, okay. exactly. So if they, for example, had uh, um, a chip, let's call it a chip. If they had a chip where, where which has a rectangular structure where each layer talks to all the other nodes next to it, then you could easily calculate the, the differential. I mean, the, the discretized differentiate. You could perform differentiation there for all the domain walls. So, but now let's move on to a more, actually more interesting case. I said, the problem here is that we cannot solve the differential equation on the D-wave quantum computer directly. But what we think we see, we see is that D-wave actually, and it's actually, it's disputed in the literature, but I think uh, wrongly, D-wave, the D-wave quantum computer um, is a genuine quantum system which um, takes over the full quantum dynamics for you. So you do not need to encode the quantum uh, the differential equation, but all you need to do is you need to encode the potential, initialize the, the state in this potential, and then have the quantum computer perform the full dynamics, the quantum dynamics for you. And this is what I would like to talk about next, where I would argue that this D-Wave quantum computer is actually a quantum laboratory for QFTs. So you will be able to see instanton transitions in real time. And this is not possible usually because um, you, you can see instanton transitions. Tunneling, for example, we have uh, transi transmission electron microscopes and so on. We know that tunneling exists. We can also see the effects, but we can't do it. We, we have quantum gas, we have um, solid state physics where you can see instanton processes occur, but only in a given field theory, namely the field theory realized by nature. Here, the D-Wave quantum computer allows to modify your field theory and therefore um, allows you to use this as a laboratory for freely chosen quantum field theory, where you then can see instanton transitions occur before your eye, essentially. So what we have here uh, is we start with a simple example uh, again, and we take this uh, Tench and Sesh potential, which we encode now on this um, uh, D-Wave quantum annealer. So you have a time-dependent uh, component here, the tangent square potential would just be on the right-hand side, the solid blue line. And then after a certain amount of time, you can switch on um, the SASH contribution and you can construct a deeper minimum 
Um, and what we want to see is, first of all, that the state forms. Uh, um, in, in, you can measure the eigenfunction of the state that forms in the actual potential. And then we want to see a tunnel from this uh, false vacuum into the true vacuum. And of course, because this is actually calculable, we want to compare then with the theoretically calculated um, um, yeah, result for the tunneling rate. So this is the usual calculation you are doing here, but just calculating the steepest gradient descent method for your action. And then you can express the logarithm of the decay rate um, here in, as a dependence on gamma. Gamma is the effective coupling. So it's h bar divided by 2m. And uh, the VEF is the VEF, uh, the displacement from the uh, true vacuum, from the false vacuum. And D-Wave allows you to reverse anneal. So what we are going to do is we will initialize classically at one point. Then we will crank up the quantumness of the system. It will form a wave function. And then we will collapse the wave function in terms of a measurement afterwards. And you can see this here um, as an example uh, in, in these different figures. So what we do is we have only one well. Then we let the state settle. It will form a wave function. Then uh, we will switch on the second well, it will tunnel, and then we perform the measurement and we'll see how often it tunnels. And I would like to do this actually in real time. So let's have a look. You can still see this, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's execute it. What we are doing here, we are now logging. I mean, I'm, I'm in the UK, but now I'm logging into the D-Wave quantum computer. I submit this potential. This is our first step. And now we perform a measurement. I submit 500 uh, five, um, runs with 500 shots. And I perform this measurement here. And what you see here is this was the first shot. You see, we have initialized with this dashed line, a classical state. Then we have switched on the quantumness and it forms the eigenfunction that you would expect in this uh, potential. So all we are doing here is actually a true measurement. You see this now running. It's an actual experiment we are performing right now on the D-Wave quantum computer. And statistics is not great. I have only performed 2,500 shots, um, but we are getting there and it will resemble then the eigenfunction um, that you would expect for such a time square potential. So this is the fifth shot. And you see statistics could be better, but it essentially forms from a classically initialized state. Um, it will uh, then perform due to the quantum dynamics that are provided on the D-Wave quantum computer, it will form this um, ground state eigenfunction. Now let's have a look and we want to actually see the instant on transition. So we want to see tunneling here. This would of course be much more exciting. So what we do is we start with the first potential, the blue one, and then after a certain amount of time, namely after letting it settle for 40 microseconds, I um, let it tunnel for 100 microseconds each time. In, and I switch on here this uh, deeper minimum in my potential. So what will we get? First shot is now being performed again. 500 measurements are, are done. OK, so this was the first shot. And you see here, there is some tunneling that uh, goes through into the, um, into the deeper well. This was not there, right? In the previous run, I had not a deeper, uh, I, I did not uh, switch on this uh, second uh, global, mini the global minimum. So there were no transitions, of course, into the barrier. And you see here not the, what you would expect from uh, tunneling behavior uh, from this um, previously uh, yeah, from this uh, metastable vacuum essentially going into the global minimum. Okay, was this already the fifth shot? Yes. So this is the outcome essentially, and we have seen here now in real time that you can actually perform a simulation, I think an honest quantum simulation on this D-wave quantum annealer. So let's collect um, what else one has to consider. The thing is, when this settles, when this first state settles, you have a free parameter, namely the effective coupling of your, of your system, this h bar divided by m. 
um, and this is given by this gamma here. Um, and what we do is we fit um, this gamma to the wave function that forms, and then we can use this to actually calculate what the tunnel probability is, um, because this is a system dependent uh, a parameter that has to be fitted and cannot be calculated from first principle. This is really the internal quantum dynamics that are being provided by the system. Um, but what you see here as well is you can now run it for different V, um, for different vacuum expectation value values from 2 to 3.5 when you see a, dec a decline. So it's of course less likely for the system to tunnel given 100 microseconds um, if V is uh, further apart from your metastable vacuum, this is how it sh uh, should actually behave. And then you can compare the theory calculation, the theory decay rate of your metastable system um, with the experimental value. And it's not perfect. It's really um, an order of one error, essentially. But um, you see that it performs, it, at least functionally, it follows this. And there's a lot to optimize, obviously. But you can see here a non-perturbative phenomenon uh, in real life uh, in real time unfold essentially for a theory that you can choose and submit to the system. Um, the other result would exactly it also scales with the time tunneling time so if you give it more time it will tunnel more obviously uh, from t equals 50 microseconds 100 to 150 microseconds. And then the question is always with these d-wave machines and I, I'm aware of the time um, um, with these D-Wave machines, is whether it is actually quantum or thermal. Um, because you could imagine still that you actually go over the barrier, right? Maybe it's a fake. Maybe what I'm showing you here is actually not really a tunneling process, but we have a, a finite temperature and excite the state over the barrier and it falls into the uh, deep minimum. And this is what I then make of tunneling, but in fact, it was going over the barrier. So to make sure that this is not the case, we devised a new experiment. Uh, where we have now a potential uh, u1 let the state settle here and then we have a green and a red potential after so after uh, having the state settle in the uh, blue potential first um, and of course if red was realized if tunneling was realized you should not see uh, anything going from the blue potential into the green potential at least not much it needs to be said that the ground state of the um, of the set of the tangent potential is actually not of obviously, quantum mechanically, it's not in the zero, zero point. It's elevated in energy. So you're actually at 0 0.4 or so in the energy. So very little will actually go uh, due to tunneling over uh, into the small dip of the green um, potential shape. But the red one, obviously, is fairly deep. So if, if, and since the width of the green and the red potential is very similar, if it really went over the barrier, then you should have uh, more or less the same uh, number of uh, transitions from the metastable vacuum into either the green or the red potential well. Now let's see what the outcome is. We start with blue, let it settle, then go to green. And as you see, almost nothing uh, tunnels. Maybe there's a small contribution from a thermal contribution, but most of it is not there. But then if you have an actual global potential well, which should allow you to tunnel actually underneath the barrier, you get a large significant contribution and one that is actually behaving as expected. So this is in our, um, in our view, uh, con yeah, uh, a proof that it's actually going underneath the barrier and not over the barrier uh, when it uh, performs this tunneling process. Now, the other thing is uh, quantum supremacy is usually, uh, there are different um, um, definitions of quantum supremacy, but what you would actually um, potentially consider quantum supremacy is when a quantum computer outperforms a classical computers by a significant amount. And if you want to solve the um, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, what you will see is, first of all, on your laptop using Mathematica or so, it will take hours. It's not so trivial to actually calculate here um, and uh, calculate the solution to a time-depending Schrodinger equation. The other observation is a phenomenological one. You would actually not see um, the whole lump move as one lump into the ground state. But what you would see is you would see some leaking over. You leak into the ground state. You leak. Uh, along the gradient of this potential, and you would have some wave movements back and forth. This is what you would see. So now 
even this one-dimensional example here takes several hours to perform on a, on, a, on a classical computer with Mathematica. What we wanted to do is to actually do a two-dimensional example, phi 1 and phi 2. We start here at the lower part in this well, say at phi 2 equals to 0 and minus 2 for phi 1, and let it evolve. And this only takes a few uh, microseconds for each measurement, but we will perform multiple measurements. So we will perform 3,000 measurements for uh, different time steps in, um, in the tunneling, in the settling, in the, in the time we give the system to um, evolve according its quantum dynamics. So this is what we see. And first of all, we see on the one hand exactly what we have calculated, namely that it doesn't move over as one lump. It has this um, yeah, wavy behavior, go slightly back and forth, but mostly obviously from this um, uh, metastable situation into the global minimum. And on the left-hand side, you see here a three-dimensional I mean, uh, measurement, and on the right-hand side, you see a two-dimensional measurement. So it does what it's supposed to do. It shows quantum dynamics and um, measuring this is much, much faster than um, actually calculating it on a Mathematica classical computer. So this brings me to the summary, slightly overrun, sorry. Um, so the summary and future directions could be for such an approach that, um, first of all, we have, I hope, it established that um, you can actually encode solutions to mathematical problems into the ground state of uh, complex dynamical systems and uh, solve them by optimizing the system. We did this for a classical neural network, we did it in a hybrid approach, and we did it um, um, using a quantum computer. Um, Near-term uh, quantum computers might provide a much rich, much more um, sophisticated environment that allows us potentially then to address even more sophisticated questions. Previously, we heard the question about uh, quantum gauge theories. This would, of course, be uh, um, very uh, interesting to do. Lattice gauge theories. Um, um, However, unfortunately, the connectivity is not there yet for this D-wave machine. You have seen that you can actually access the quantum computer. You can perform your experiment there. But going beyond a scalar theory would require a large level of connectivity and a large number of qubits. And uh, unfortunately, this is not there at the moment. So, but of course, in the longer run, uh, and hopefully on near-term devices um, on these quantum annealers, we might be able actually to perform measurements and see uh, quantum systems evolve dynamically rather than performing uh, calculations given a certain theoretical method um, to see these dynamics of these systems. So rather than performing a fixed order perturbative calculation, for example, for a, a certain phenomenon, we could potentially put it uh, into this uh, physical system and see it evolve based on the quantum dynamics of the system, which should cover also non-perturbative effects and of course all kinds of higher order corrections. Um, and that's essentially the uh, summary and outlook for uh, where I hope this can go. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Thank you. And uh, the floor is open to questions. Anyone? Uh, is is this any useful for uh, many body uh, quantum systems where you want to understand real time dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I mean, this is certainly something you can do. You have to encode the, I mean, this was already exactly this, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So this is essentially it, but it's just, in this case, it's just two fields and you would have to encode more fields essentially. Yeah, and yeah. so it would be, uh, I mean, does this relate to questions related to, uh, you know, out of time correlations or, or ETH, that kind of question? Yeah, you can address these things exactly. And this is what we are looking into. And is it useful? I mean, has it shown to be powerful in this connection or is it still too early? It's, it's too early. I think we just put this out and um, at this point and we, so I mean, personally, I think I'm fairly excited about it because you don't get very often the chance to come up with um, um, a formalism 
then essentially hijack somebody else's uh, experiment, implement your formalism yeah. on this experiment and do something they didn't think was possible on their end, right? So d sure. for example, was not aware of um, uh, that you can actually simulate field theories on their devices. And they think it's interesting, but this is a commercial company and they want to sell it to, um, I don't know, the private sector in some sense. So for us theorists, and uh, it, this might be a, a, a nice way of uh, using their frameworks, but we are probably not the, the target audience for their commercial enterprise. Mm. Well, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, uh, Ising model uh, in, let's say, I guess you were thinking about three dimensions, right? Yeah, I mean, this would be ideal, right? So if you could, for example, because the Ising model in three dimensions can, uh, is an NP-hard problem and is shown to be very, very difficult to solve. Um, cannot be solved by brute force uh, computation, but if you could encode essentially just the Ising model in three dimensions with full connectivity on a quantum computer, you could see it evolve in real time. You can calculate the correlation function. So you would be interested in dynamics in this case, or? Yes. Yeah, I mean, real time dynamics then, or, yeah. or, or, or not just uh, sort of uh, the imaginary time dynamics, which is frequently studied by people. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I would. Yeah, all, all kinds of dynamics you could uh, um, look into that way. Thank you. And wonderful talk. Thanks. Uh, I have a question by May. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, yes. Um, so I was um, thinking. So in so recently in condensed matter physics, there is a lot of focus and work in uh, non emission. Uh, uh, quantum phases, uh, because basically it's a way to understand uh, quantum dissipation, where we have non-unitary evolution, for instance. So I was wondering if your approach, what uh, you have described in your nice talk, can be eventually extended also in this kind of regime, where uh, we lose uh, the emission condition or Somehow. Yeah, exactly. So this is a, it's a very good question. The whole system is dissipative here. I mean, this is, um, and quantum annealer is dissipative. Um, and you, however, I mean, the ground state is long lived. So one question is also coherence, right? Very often um, when you compare quantum uh, gate computers and quantum annealers, then coherence is a big issue. Um, but not in this case, because the, the, what we are encoding here is the ground state essentially of a system. So, I mean, the hydrogen atom, the ground state will not lose coherence, right? Just, right. And, uh, and therefore, it's the same here. You, you go into the ground state, it's an eigen um, function, and uh, you essentially can stay there for a long amount of time. So coherence is not uh, lost or an issue here, even for, for this um, quantum annealer. But you are referring to non-Hamiltonians, -Hamilton for example, yeah. for open systems and... Right. Um, um, to be honest, I haven't thought about this here in this context at all. I'm, I'm, this is, I think, much too early because I would rather uh, look into uh, situations at this point that can be um, understood and calculated uh, and um, to make sure that everything behaves as it should and then step by step extending this. And of course, at some point, one could potentially think about open systems, but um, I think this is too, for me, it's at least too early. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I ask so, a question? Yes, go ahead, Bal. Okay. First is, I think Jan Dominico was talking about so-called PT-symmetric Hamiltonians, where mm -hmm. the non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, which have PT-symmetry, that's what people normally call. Yeah. But there, what happens is that the, interact, the scalar product is non-local. Yeah. So the issue arises whether one can simulate that situation too. Okay. The, the scalar product is intrinsically non-local. Yeah, so the thing is you, you could probably, so this would, a non-local Hamiltonian would then correspond to something you could, in, you need to encode in your J matrix in your Ising model. And you would not have only nearest neighbor interactions, but you would have long range interactions essentially across this uh, Ising model. Mm -hmm. This technically, I mean, you can do this and you can probably do it with a thermal annealer and look into this, but uh, the quantum annealer, and, um, has not enough connectivity for you to find an embedding on the quantum annealer to be able to simulate this in real time. 
this is the issue. Uh, but in principle, um, non-local interactions should be, uh, yeah, you can encode, but you can then classically simulate it. And this is also interesting to look into. For example, I showed you an example for skirmions and for domain walls and these kind of categorizations on spin lattice systems. There, in such a framework, you can actually encode uh, non-local interactions. Uh, next to next to nearest neighbor interactions and all these kind of things um, and you can simulate them um, It's just here. It's a technical limitation so, yeah. One more question I want to ask The calculations are done in Euclidean time okay? yes. then the Topological terms for example the theta term in the uh, there's an eye in front of that object in the action in the Euclidean region okay? So there is a lot of problem in simulating that term. Okay. What happens here? So this is a scalar theory that it doesn't have uh, any uh, topological term essentially. So there is no. So how do you handle? Can one handle topological terms? You can handle topological terms if you uh, use a spin system. So before, as I, the, I mean these the systems I talked before, uh, the classical ones. Um, have obviously a spin orientation and the spin orientation can be used to take the phase into account. Um, in a classical simulation you can do this. Here in this quantum annealer um, you, uh, you cannot. That's the thing. Okay. So Other questions? Early, I, think. I mean, I'm, I'm also keen on applying these things to all kinds of different uh, applications, obviously. And I really think there's a, a huge amount of potential, but it requires a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, it requires a little bit of uh, engagement with um, the experimentalists in some sense, or with the people that provide uh, such a quantum machine. Um, I, but however, I'm already uh, fairly uh, excited about uh, seeing what you can actually do here in real time um, for, a, for a normal scalar field theory. One thing would be then to implement, for example, only interactions between scalar particles, uh, multi-dimensional, multi-body uh, scalar systems and these kind of things and see them evolve. It's of course not the killer application that you, you would maybe solve QCD or these kind of things or have non-perturbative effects and build bound states and mesons and these kind of things which you would probably would like to be able to at some point but unfortunately technically we are not there yet um, for this is the first step to provide a framework and a formalism to uh, encode higher more sophisticated uh, field theories at some point on uh, such an uh, icing model and then on a annealer more questions? Werner, you look like you're about to ask a question. Well, um, maybe I, I missed the connection uh, between the two parts of your talk, uh, the AI uh, neural network and then the, the quantum computation. Uh, or uh, is there something in the background? Or? Yeah, so I, I built this up. I think the, the connection I established quite uh, in the beginning, probably on the first or second slide, because um, what I was alluding to was the observation that you can actually build complex uh, systems that allow you to perform a calculation um, by encoding the solution of this calculation into the ground state of a dynamical system. And I went back to protein folding, uh, where you have essentially in a highly a complex configuration space, um, um, the situation that very, very quickly the protein relaxes or into um, one specific conformation. And um, if we could do this, if we could build complex systems that by um, optimizing a certain function or a certain energy potential for these systems um, would provide a solution to a mathematical problem, then um, we could make use of this nice effect that re nature has essentially for us in stock, has in stock and apply this to uh, complicated problems in theory, in, party, or in, in, uh, in quantum field theory. And one thing is such a dynamical system exists on the one hand in a classical approach using this neural net approach. And on the other hand, we can do this for a quantum annealer as well. There's also a system which has this energy landscape and you're trying to find the, or go into the global minimum of this energy landscape. And if you encode the solution of your problem in this uh, minima respectively, and for the neural network, this would be the loss function. 
whereas for the quantum annealer, it would be the energy potential of the quantum annealer, or for a thermal annealer, it would also be the ground state of the energy potential, then you can actually provide, obtain a solution through optimization um, to field theoretical problems. This was the connection. And then I said, I will go from uh, classical systems over hybrid systems to a quantum system. And in the quantum system, and this is the amazing part, the dynamics are entirely provided by the system itself. We do not, in the other cases, we solve the, uh, um, um, the Euler-Lagrange equations. Just a differential equation, and we, we simulate the dynamics of the fields using the uh, solution to a differential equation. Whereas in the quantum uh, system, the dynamics are entirely provided by the quantum computer or by the quantum system themselves. And so all we had to uh, build in there was just the potential. And then we initialized in, at one point on the system and the, then the tunneling and all the dynamics, rolling down the hill, tunneling or whatever you do, is completely taken over by the quantum system itself. So this was kind of <laughs> the upshot of the talk essentially. Yeah. Uh, but do, uh, do you have any uh, concrete problem uh, for which there would be an overlap uh, where you would be uh, interested in, in comparing uh, one approach to the other? I mean, I kind of compared the approaches to each other because I've applied them to the same example, uh, basically to tunneling and the formation of bubble equations, right? So I, I, I showed that you can use each of these approaches to solve the issue and essentially get the dynamics of uh, tunneling from a metastable vacuum to into the into a global minimum. Uh, okay, um, yeah, but it's a bit artificial because for the tunneling uh, you you would not think about using AI for that uh, from the start. Right, exactly. You would not need to. But what I also showed is that AI or machine learning gives you a more reliable way of doing it, and, and it scales well into higher dimensions. And you can even then provide these solutions to a wide community rather than just calculating and drawing the solutions by hand, essentially, or using over undershoot methods and these kind of other things. So there are different advantages to using a neural network. Uh, and But exactly, this is what I like about your comment. You wouldn't think it, uh, think to use the neural network um, out right from the start. There are different other methods. And I think nobody really, I mean, very few people actually thought about using neural networks to actually perform a calculation. They are using neural networks to actually find correlations in large dimensional parameter space. But when you come to realize that an optimization is nothing else but um, a calculation, if you just put the functional directly into the loss function, then you can use it for every calculation you would like to do um, uh, the, the actual self-adaptive approach of a neural network. But for protein foldings, uh, neural networks do, do pretty well. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, people use the Alpha Zero uh, machine uh, for, for protein folding with quite good results. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Just, I mean, one of the things that you didn't mention uh, there in any of the talk was entropy. And uh, be, uh, presumably that's because you're dealing with say, one of you're dealing with quantum systems and a, a unique ground state. Yes. But the example that you quoted to show that it wasn't tunneling, that it was tunneling rather than uh, uh, going over the barrier, mm -hmm. I would have thought the entropy might play a, a crucial role in the difference between the two. And I, I didn't quite understand how you would uh, control that. Or even if you can. I mean, the configuration space has the same size uh, for both examples, obviously. And um, I, I'm here in this case, the question was only whether the whole system contains so much temperature that you could actually excite the state over the barrier, or if um, it does not, and it seems not, because otherwise you should be able to populate this small well uh, of this green uh, potential shape. Um, which you see here on the left side uh, in the results uh, that this is not happening. Um, but when I then have a true global minimum adjacent to the metastable uh, minimum, then you actually see a tunneling procedure and a tunneling process. Um, so this indicates that this is a true quantum tunneling process and not a thermal annealing process where you go over the barrier and excite the state enough to actually roll over and drop into the deeper well. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
Thank you. Are there other questions? Well, if not, I will stop the recording and uh, uh, we can be less formal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.